Jacques Derrida is a French philosopher and the leading figure in the transformation of literary and cultural studies that swept through the English-speaking world in the past 20 years. In particular, he launched the massively influential concept of deconstruction. Deconstruction is an approach to reading and listening, which rather than trying to uncover an author's essential argument or underlying intention, attends instead to the shifting and contradictory patterns that play on the surface of a text. Deridian deconstruction has many enemies, though, and it's been accused of undermining Western values and the very idea of the human subject, leaving only relativism or nihilism in their place. <laughs> Derrida's conversation with Alan Montefiore in the Sheldonian Theatre is part of a series organised by Oxford Amnesty Lectures. Well, Jacques, this is a slight, slightly formal and picturesque setting for a discussion, but let us try and ig ignore the picturesqueness of it. Uh, we were told that the discussion, at least I was told, that the discussion was to be directed towards, and I semi-quote, I pa paraphrase, the ethical and political problems posed by the dissolution and deconstruction of the subject in the terms that the liberal tradition has taken the human being to be the subject of his or her own experience, life, activity, responsibilities, and so on. Still paraphrasing, uh, does this subject, the subject whose freedom Amnesty International, for example, seeks everywhere to defend uh, in the name of human rights, or the so-called rights of man, does this subject still exist? If not, what sense can be made of this freedom that we are so concerned to protect. Well, that was the theme we were given for the discussion. And there are, of course, a lot of problematic terms here, not least the very term subject. But I thought it'd be helpful if we could start if you could, by asking you if you could just explain in simple terms, however misleading simple terms may be at a certain level, just what you take to be the deconstruction of the subject or what you take it to amount to, and why, as I know, you see this not, in fact, as a threat, uh, but rather, indeed, as a move towards strengthening our appreciation of the importance of protecting human freedom. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it's a very... Thank you, for, first, for being here. It's a very intimidating audience. And first, I thought when I uh, was honored by the invitation that the, the format of a, of a discussion would be more appropriate than the formal lecture, and I think I made a mistake because I, uh, if, if, I had, if I had prepared something, I would be, I would be protected by a, by, by, by a written text. So I wanted to come here unprotected, just totally vulnerable to questions from the floor, and I've just been told that there would be no questions from the floor. <laughs> so that's the first, the first, the first threat to human rights. Uh, uh, now, uh, I'll try nevertheless to, to, to answer Alan's uh, simple questions. <laughs> um, uh, of course, I don't know to, to what extent the, the word deconstruction of the subject is familiar to all of you. It's, it's uh, deconstruction is an is an ugly and difficult word. And uh, I'll try to, uh, answering uh, Alan's uh, request, try to, to speak uh, in a uh, jargon-free language, as they say in, in the United States, jargon-free, or, or to say cholesterol-free, or uh, uh, sugar-free. Uh, <laughs> so uh, jargon-free, jargon-free language. Uh, uh, first of all, I would say that, uh, using one of your words, that deconstruction of the subject, if there is such a thing, which I doubt, uh, can in no case amount to a dissolution of the subject. Deconstruction doesn't mean, in, to me, dissolution. Which means that when you deconstruct, and I'll try to, to explain what I mean by that, when you deconstruct anything, you simply do not 
destroy or dissolve or, or cancel the, the legitimacy of what you're deconstructing. In that case, deconstructing the subject, if there is such a, 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 a thing, would mean first to analyze historically, historically in a, in a genealogical way, uh, the formation and the, the different layers which have uh, built, so to speak, a concept. Every concept has, a, has its own history, and the concept of subject has a very, very long, heavy, and complex history. Uh, for, first, for instance, in English, in the English tradition, philosophical tradition, the word subject uh, is not used the same way, or sometimes it's not used as a, as a canonical concept. The way it is used in continental philosophy, in German philosophy, in, in French philosophy. So first we have to translate uh, these words into uh, first a different idiom, and finally in uh, all the possible idioms. Since we're supposed to, to address here the problem of human rights, we face first the problem of language. If there are human rights, uh, which means universally valid human rights, they should be accessible, understandable to everyone, whatever language they, they understand or they, they, they speak. Now, if you try to make the, the word subject understandable in a culture in which the philosophical Greek, German, Latin trans, uh, tradition is not uh, familiar, then uh, the, the word doesn't mean anything. So the first thing you have to do is a, a, is a universal translation of what the, the subject is. So deconstruction of the subject is first, uh, among other things, uh, the, ana the, the genealogical analysis of the trajectory through which the concept has been built, uh, used, uh, uh, legitimized, and so on and so forth. In, uh, to say just a few words about, about this tradition, what we call a subject uh, was first in, let's say, the Aristotelian tradition, the hypokaimenon, the substance, something which is underneath, identical to itself, and different from the different proprieties, qualities, uh, attributes. It is the, uh, the center of an identity. Everything which occurs to a subject is something, is an event which occurs to it, but which doesn't constitute it. So the subject is something uh, identical to itself, uh, in the, uh, um, cannot be divided, and uh, uh, can be counted up as one. Uh, now, when you deconstruct the subject, you analyze all the, the assumptions, the hidden assumptions, which are um, implied in the philosophical or the, the ethical or the juridical or the political use of the, the concept of subject. Now, as you know, the human rights, what we call the human rights, is a, a set of concepts, laws, requirements, which were not given in nature from the beginning. It has been a long, a long conquest, a long battle to formulate what the human rights are or should be. And it's in the, in the process of this constitution of the human rights that the concept of, of subject has been referred to. Uh, uh, from the Aristotelian tradition, then to Cartesian tradition, the ego cogito, and then the, uh, the Kantian, Kantian I think, the, uh, when Kant says, the I think, ich denke, must accompany all my representations, and whatever uh, experience I, I, I have or I make, it is referred to a subject, to the, an I who says, which says, or uh, I, I, 
and the eye is supposed to be the subject identical to itself and uh, always intact under all circumstances in every culture, in every different empirical context. Uh, so uh, deconstructing the subject means uh, being aware of those historical uh, components. And as you know, since we were here in, in, the, context, in the context of the, the battle uh, fought by Amnesty International, Amnesty International refers itself in its very uh, chart to a declaration of universal rights, the universal declaration of, of human rights. And as you know, this declaration of human rights has itself a history. It hasn't been given for once. There has been a number of such declarations from uh, the French Revolution on. But of course, in England, they or you uh, suppose that before the French Revolution, you had already uh, a concept of civil, of, civil, of, of human rights, uh, the Mag Magna Carta, and so on and so forth. But since the first declaration as such of the human rights, a number of other declarations have uh, transformed and determined, determined more and more the formal concept of human rights. At the beginning, uh, the human being was uh, de defined or determined as uh, the owner of its, his or her own property with no sexual uh, uh, determination. Uh, the, the right to, to work, for instance, was not inscribed in the, in, the, in the first declarations. So during almost two centuries now, two centuries now, there has been a number of de such declarations trying to redefine and to uh, determine more and more specifically what the human rights are. So determining what the subject is. The subject is not simply a formal, a formal identity. Uh, it's, it's, uh, 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 is is the, the, the child a subject? Is a woman a subject? Uh, is a non-European uh, individual a subject? So deconstructing the subject is taking into account all the determinations and trying, that's why it's not a threat to, to the human rights, trying to improve the, the, the concept of, of the, the, the human subject. The way you put it suggests to me that it might almost be fair to couple the phrase, the deconstruction of the subject, with the sort of counterbalancing phrase and the reconstruction, perhaps the continual ongoing reconstruction of the subject. I'm led to think of this by the way you talk of the constant battle to improve our understanding and perhaps to add to our, uh, to enrich our concepts of what constitute human rights. because. Uh, if you link, uh, you must tell me if I've understood this point correctly, but if you link the concept of human rights to the concept of the human subject in the way in which you have done, and then one goes on to talk of the enrichment of one's understanding of human rights, this amounts, of course, to a, an enrichment, an ongoing transformation of the concept of the human subject itself. Mm -hmm. So that these, what has turned into really a, a sort of slogan, as many people now use the phrase, the deconstruction or the deconstruction, of the subject, if we're to stick to the level of slogans, maybe should be replaced in its turn. It should be deconstructed in its yeah. turn, and we should add the term reconstruction. I don't, know. I, I, I don't mind uh, dropping the word deconstruction. I, I say this from the beginning. I have no special attachment to, uh, to this word. Uh, uh, but now it is, it is uh, used, so I don't want simply to... to, to, uh, uh, to uh, get rid of, what, of, of the work which has been done, I think a positive work which has been done under this, this word, this title. But from the beginning I was not, uh, I was a little surprised by the, the let's say, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fortune, the good fortune or the bad fortune of this, of this word. Now, uh, nevertheless, I would not simply replace deconstruction by reconstruction because reconstruction would simply simply stay within a given space in which we're supposed to know what has to be done 
and uh, what are the foundations on which we have to construct, to reconstruct, to build. And uh, I don't think anything is firmly assured, firmly grounded uh, in this uh, area. First of all, of course, uh, I won't bore you with the, uh, the discussions on the, on the, the, the word deconstruction, um, but I would simply say this. First, it is necessary, I, I would say, and that's part of the, of the, of, uh, uh, the discussion, of free discussion of, of a, uh, a modern task, of a modern enlightenment, not to uh, rely on slogans. When you hear deconstruction of the subject, this is a slogan. Usually, it's, it's used by people who want to avoid the, uh, what they, 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 they consider the, uh, the threat coming from deconstruction. So, well, deconstruction is simply a negative uh, uh, project which uh, undermines everything and doesn't leave, doesn't leave anything in, in place, and we have to, to uh, reject uh, this. Uh, I have constantly, uh, I'm not be the, the only one to do that, but I have constantly insisted on the, uh, uh, on the contrary, on the fact that deconstruction was mainly uh, uh, affirmation. Affirmation. Affirmation doesn't mean reconstruction, doesn't mean position, something positive. But it means uh, a constant reference to a yes. Yes, I, uh, I speak to you, I address you, I listen to you. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a thinking of the affirmation. Now, this aff affirmation is not simply reconstruction. When you use the word reconstruction in a given context, of course, you imply that something uh, you, which is precious to you has been threatened or destroyed and you have to simply rebuild. No, it's not a matter of rebuilding. It's a matter of, of going further, displacing, uh, um, uh, changing. And changing the world or changing society, changing uh, the, the state of things in terms of human rights, for instance, is not simply reconstructing. It's constructing something else, something other. And deconstruction, is, if it is uh, uh, an ethics, I'm a little suspicious by the word eth ethics. I don't want to, to, to scare you, but uh, uh, I'm a little suspicious about the word deconstruction, uh, reconstruction, deconstruction too, sure, and ethics. Nevertheless, if you call this an ethics of affirmation, it implies that you are attentive to otherness, to the alterity of the other, to something new and other. That's why when I refer to, for instance, to uh, democracy, we have to speak on democracy today, because uh, the very concept of human rights as an essential link to uh, an ideal of democracy. I immediately add democracy to come, not democracy as we know it, not democracy as a uh, reliable state of things in our uh, wonderful uh, uh, Western societies. Uh, democracy has to be improved, uh, and uh, at, the, at the core of, uh, of the, the idea of democracy, uh, there is a promise, uh, there is uh, some openness to, to the future, and the openness to the future and the openness to the other implies that you don't simply reconstruct you don't simply reconstruct. Uh, uh, that's why I, if, if you leave me the choice <laughs> uh, in terms of vote, votation, between uh, this and this, I would always prefer deconstruction to reconstruction. Uh, but uh, to the extent that deconstruction is not destruction. One of the fears, I think, that many of the so-called critics of deconstruction have had has been that it in some way undermines the rationality of the subject or the thought that the subject could commit it himself or herself with clear conscious intent to some rationally undertaken project. 
And I wonder if in this context, and before we go on to the next topic we wanted to talk, talk about, you might have a word of explanation or reassurance mm. or perhaps non-reassurance. I'm not here to, uh, to reassure uh, any, anyone. <laughs> I'm not, I, I didn't travel to reassure anyone. Uh, uh, things first, first, in order to, 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 to think or to, to do something political, you don't have to be reassured. You don't have to be reassured. Uh, on the contrary, you have to be anxious and, and sometimes scared by, 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 by the task which is in, in, in front of you. Now, on the problem of, of rationality, I would, re I would reply almost the same thing, I mean, formally the same thing. Uh, the people who say that, that deconstruction is, is, is uh, undermining rationality, first, they don't read. And second, second, they refer to a certain state, a certain set of norms they call reason, rationality. And in the same way that the subject has a history, reason has a history. Uh, the, the, our um, rationalism today cannot be the same as uh, rationalism, let's say, for instance, in the 18th century when <clears throat> The, the concept of the rights of man, the revolution, and, and the declaration of uh, universal rights uh, has been, uh, for the first time, uh, is established. Uh, that's why I uh, uh, would describe deconstruction as a, ration, as a uh, modern rationalism, which tries to incorporate uh, new disciplines, new forms of rationality. When you take, for instance, into account, let's, let's take this, Massive example, uh, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, which, uh, whatever you think about the complexity of uh, uh, psychoanalysis, which teaches us that uh, a, what we call a subject is not simply consciousness, is not simply the ego. Uh, uh, there is repression. There is there are uh, uh, sometimes a split subject. Uh, a multiplicity within the individual, and so on and so forth. And when you take this into account, and to uh, integrate, to incorporate the reference to psychoanalysis in uh, not only the theory, but the practice of law, for instance, of human rights. Who is responsible for, for murder, for instance? Who is responsible for, uh, for a strike? Who is responsible for uh, uh, a political uh, gesture? The question of this responsibility, uh, once you uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that a subject is not simply any, a, a, a transparent ego, uh, uh, refle uh, reflexive ego, totally present to itself, then you have to transform uh, uh, your approach. You have to transform the, the very concept of reason. And uh, to me, psychoanalysis is not irrational. It's a new component of uh, modern rationality. The same with physics, the same with, with uh, biogenetics, uh, all those uh, current problems, the problem of bioethics, the problem of, of graftings, the problem of birth uh, control, the problems of, of uh, the uh, excess, the excess of uh, um, people who until now had no access to human rights. Uh, children, uh, women, and so on and so forth, imply that you re rebuild, if you want, the, the, the concept of reason. So, uh, of course, when you say, well, reason is not simply what you thought it was, then people stand up and say, well, you, you are an irrationalist. You are simply threatening reason. No, uh, on the contrary, I think that it's, it's in, the name, in the name of uh, a new rationalism that deconstruction is necessary. So I, I don't accept, of course, uh, the charge of uh, uh, irrationalism on, 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 the contrary, on the contrary. Well, I must say, I quite like the idea of rebuilding reason because uh, without it wanting... It rebuilds itself constantly. Yeah. It's, well, it's when, a, it, without wanting to tease you too much about it, rebuilding, I like it because it's rather close to the notion of reconstructing. Keep it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm rushing you from one enormous topic to another, but it would be a shame 
not to ask you to say something about your work on this other big topic of national nationalism. Um, obviously, uh, the relationship between an individual and his nationality, or his or her nationality or culture, enters into part of the general problem or problematic of how one thinks of the human subject. But you see, you see, uh, dealing in 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 uh, sixty minutes with deconstruction of the subject, presence, the friendship, and nationality is simply not human. It's a good <laughs> uh, 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 it was in eighty. Uh, two or three, that we started uh, seminars on nationality. And at the time, of course, the problem of nationality is, is a, an old problem. But at the time, it didn't have the, uh, let's say, the burning, the burning uh, uh, presence it has now. Uh, and we, what we did first uh, was uh, to analyze the reason why philosophy as such, contrary to what we usually think, philosophy is always nationally determined. Usually we think philosophy is a universal discourse, and it, it crosses the borders of uh, languages, nations, uh, determined groups, and it, uh, it claims to address the, the, the universal problems. But in fact, not only do we know that philosophy as such, philosophy in the strict sense, was from the beginning uh, linked to uh, determined cities, languages, Greek for instance, and that a philosophical, a philosophical concept is not simply a, a conventionally associated with a Greek word. When I say usia uh, or uh, on for, for being, it not, it's not simply a conventional sign associated with a, a concept. You cannot dissociate a concept from a language, from a, what we call a natural language. Uh, so from the very beginning, philosophy was uh, determined by a cultural, historical, and some put this in, take in quotation marks, national or ethical uh, uh, context. Then, uh, when the modern forms of nationalisms appeared in Europe in the 19th century, I would say, uh, it was not in a, in a non-philosophical form. Every nationalism, every national affirmation, takes the form of a philosophy. When a nation says, uh, uh, we are German, for instance, let's say Fichte's discourse, we are Germans, but this doesn't mean that we are simply a uh, particular people among others. We are, being German means being responsible for humanity, being the best philosophers being, uh, having on us the burden of being responsible for, being witnesses responsible for the totality of humanity. And this statement is a philosophical statement. And every, each time a, a nation uh, uh, affirms itself as such, they don't say, the, na the, the people don't say, we are such and such, we have we are blue eyes and blonde hair and so on. No, they say, we are the uh, the best representative of, of mankind. And then a uh, uh, philosophical discourse follows before that. So uh, we try to demonstrate, I can't of course do this here now, to demonstrate that all the nationalistic discourses were uh, philosophically structured, were philosophies, so to speak. And we try to understand why it, it was so, and uh, 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 why it was urgent to deconstruct this logic of uh, exemplariness, exemplarity, uh, uh, the, the statement, we are responsible for we Germans, we English people, we French, uh, we, we French 
people are uh, the, the best uh, witnesses for uh, human rights, or we uh, Jews are the elected people, etc., et and we uh, Germans, and so on. And we Europeans are now in charge of uh, human rights. And uh, all we know that, uh, I don't say this in order to be anti-Eurocentric, which is also a very uh, an exhausted and, and tired theme, nevertheless, we know that uh, uh, all the, the, the concepts, the axioms, and the languages of the human rights are uh, tied to national idioms. Today, the international law and the texts which rule the international institutions are Western text, Western discourses, uh, uh, linked not simply to a um, European nation, but to Europe as, as such. And Europe today is also the United States, maybe Japan too, and so on and so forth. So we try to, um, to analyze what uh, this uh, link between philosophy and nationality and nationalism is without simply criticizing the uh, affirmation or the desire for uh, difference, for one's idiom, one's language, one's uh, 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 group, and so on and so forth. But how is it possible to reaffirm singularity, minority, uh, specific idioms, natural languages, without giving rise to uh, what we call nationalism in its, in its violent and uh, uh, imperialistic uh, forms? Um, and what philosophy or thinking, I would, I would prefer to say thinking than philosophy, what uh, a new way of thinking should be in order to reaffirm uh, uh, differences or singularities in terms of language, tradition, and so on and so forth, memories. Uh, reaffirming this without falling into uh, nationalism. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? And, uh, it, is, it is difficult. It is difficult if one doesn't want to simply dissolve the, the idioms or the, the differences, the singularities within a universal, empty, formal language, which, as we know, is always pretending to be universal, always uh, under the authority of an hegemonic state, language, group of states. For instance, I don't want to hurt you here, but of course the English language is today uh, hegemonic. Uh, not only because uh, uh, a Frenchman has to speak English in England, but when I <laughs> lecture in Moscow, uh, I have to speak English. Uh, we, we, I communicate in English, in my uh, English, so to speak, uh, with, with Russians or, 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 or with uh, uh, sometimes Germans. So we know that today the English language is uh, um, not simply replacing all the languages on earth, but being the second universal language. Everyone has to speak his own language plus English. I don't think it's simply bad. It is very useful and better than nothing, of course. Uh, 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 it helps. It helps. But we have to be uh, uh, conscious of the fact that this universal translator, which is the English language, uh, uh, imports or, or, or conveys with it uh, some uh, uh, national hegemony, not England's hegemony, as you, as you know, but mainly American hegemony. But I'm not simply against that. We don't have to be simply against because it, it has very positive aspects. But we have to be careful, to, uh, to, to be vigilant, to be vigilant. And it, it's something, it's a task which has constantly to be redefined because uh, thanks to this universal idiom, uh, communication is made possible, especially in, in scientific and political discourse. So it's, it's a positive aspect. But this positive aspect has also its uh, negative, uh, negative uh, uh, implications. So that's why it's not 
easy to be simply against nationalism. Of course, it's easy to be against uh, the most violent imperialistic uh, forms of nationalism. This is very easy. I mean, easy, I hope, among us. Uh, but uh, uh, as soon as I, I say uh, I have a language, I speak my own language, and I don't want to give up uh, French, for instance. And it's already a form of affirming a subtle nationalism. Being, uh, um, being nationalistic, since it's not a description, when I say I speak French, uh, it's not simply uh, a constative uh, utterance, it's not simply a description. It's uh, a way of uh, committing myself. I say, well, I, I confirm it is good for me to speak French, and I prefer to speak French than English or than, than uh, in, uh, uh, algebraic Esperanto. So in that case, uh, as soon as you, you reaffirm uh, your own language, your own idiom, and uh, as soon as a poet speaks his own language, or her own language, uh, there is uh, the beginning of some nationalistic affirmation, something which doesn't simply, is not simply content with describing a situation, but trying to commit oneself, to, to, to affirm, to... to to say it's good, to, con to sign or to countersign. So you have, this is an aporia, uh, uh, and there is no political decision without going through an aporia. This is an aporia. I have to uh, reaffirm my difference and to respect the other's difference without, of course, uh, giving, uh, um, play, giving rise to uh, what we call uh, bad forms of nationalism, the aggressivity, xenophobia, uh, uh, exclusion of the other. So when you um, show some respect for the other, you have to respect his or her own language and to affirm yours. And, and that's uh, that the experience, the, the deep experience of, of translation, which is not only a political but a, a poetic, poetical, poetic problem. Thank you. Thank you.